Hi from Faculty of Communications at, at Izmir University of Economics. We are with Anita McNaught um, and uh, we will of course have this opportunity to ask a few questions about her field of expertise. Um, okay, there are so many things I can ask you, mm. but I will start with your question that you asked to Robert Fisk in 19, uh, 2004, Jill. <laughs> you based yourself in Middle East 10 years ago. In terms of writing about history being forged, you, couldn't, you could scarcely have put yourself in a better spot, couldn't yeah. you? That's true. And I, it wasn't that I was consciously following in, in Robert Fisk's eminent footsteps, but I think everyone, you know, if we are lucky enough to live for another few decades to give us the luxury of looking back over history, I think we will all agree that this was the most remarkable period in human history where some remarkable things went wrong and some remarkable things changed and some remarkably good things happened. Uh, and a great deal of heat and light uh, was expended. And uh, at the end of it all, there was no oil left and everything changed again. Uh, so, you know, there, has, there, have, there are rarely times like this tree where so much change happens in such an accelerated period of time. And when so many factors, cultural, religious, economic, converge in an area. And of course, you know, if you're an addict of history, then the Middle East defines, defines Western civilization as much as uh, Middle Eastern and Near Eastern civilization. So, you know, it's, it's all there to, to make sense of and scratch your head about and, and walk around in. Um, I do worry, though, because, you know, all of us have had a thrilling, a stimulating and enlightening, uh, a profoundly moving time working in this region during this period, and I include Turkey in this. I mean, whatever Turks feel about themselves, what Turkey has to acknowledge at the moment is that you're part of the Middle Eastern Definitely. game. Um, the Ottoman questions are back again, and not just because one particular government might yeah. like to see itself in those terms. Turkey's relationship to the Middle East, uh, Turkey's role in the Middle East, Turkey's love-hate relationship with the Middle East, Turkey's feelings of, of a constructive and destructive engagement with the Middle East are all questions that need to be re-asked and are being re-asked at this moment in history. But uh, there is always for me, and there has always been, and in this I'm not sure whether I share this with, with Robert Fisk, because we've, we've never discussed that, him and I, but uh, I worry that a lot of this is just a distraction. I worry at the end of the day if the biggest story isn't climate change. In fact, I know it is. Uh, and however people may get gloomy about the future of the world when they look at movements like the Islamic State uh, and nihilistic suicide bombers and economic decline and peak oil and all these other things. And I think and Al Qaeda and, and American military failures and all those other ways that we express um, disastrous political choices. Uh, I wonder still if the big story that all of us have missed while getting terribly excited about the Middle East is the change in the global climate and what that's going to mean for every human on this planet. Uh, and that we will look back from the luxury, if we have them, of those decades in the future and say, you know, that Al Qaeda business, that 9-11 business took our mind off the real story. And the real story was climate change which we can't fight, which no army can be raised against, mm -hmm. which no religious uh, power can be invoked to stop, mm -hmm. um, and which humanity now has to fight in a different sense. So on the one hand, yeah, mm -hmm. it's been fascinating. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I do worry if it's taken our minds off something much more important. Well, definitely. but. Being here as a journalist, of course, puts you in a really different position than most of the observers. I mean, for us, for the audiences, it's difficult to see what the details of what's going on there, especially the ISIS videos have really shocked people and it was a maybe rude awakening for many people. Mm. So let's talk about that role of being a journalist in this region mm. this time. Particularly this last week, it was FBI's warning that journalists has become the desirable targets. This is the wording. Did you feel this? Did you feel yourself as a desirable target in the market of kidnapping, for oh, instance? Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. But, uh, you know, it's not... Sure, journalists are a target because they tend to put themselves in danger. But as the world now understands, 
uh, it's not just journalists, it's aid workers, mm -hmm. uh, people working for charities, people who have no connection with military or media, uh, who just by virtue of being from a different uh, political background, from a different ethnic or religious background, mm -hmm. are therefore themselves a commodity. Look, uh, you know, this war is as much about money and power as it is about uh, religion. And uh, Western journalists realized, and Iraq was the f not the first lesson, but was the, mm -hmm. the biggest lesson, that uh, they become cards to play in a political and economic game. Uh, we know now from, finally, from the, uh, the research that has been done and the little bit of information that some governments have let slip, that the kidnapping market is an extremely lucrative one. And that if you have a Western hostage, uh, especially if they're French or Italian, uh, you can pretty much figure out exactly what they're worth on the hostage market and the government at some point will pay. Uh, what's a little more opaque is uh, what sort of deals uh, governments like Britain and America are prepared to do uh, because they don't pay and they don't negotiate, or at least that's the front of house statement, um, whether they use intermediaries like Qatar to strike deals on their behalf, which I'm certain Turkey has done, um, which would be an obvious given the closeness of uh, Doha and Ankara, um, is another question because of course London and Doha are also mm -hmm. close and the Qataris have made themselves very helpful to the British government in the past. Uh, yeah, we knew. And I didn't intend to spend the final years of my professional career uh, making uh, horror videos for my friends to cry over um, or figuring out what my value was mm -hmm. on the hostage international stock market. So when you do these jobs, you take every possible precaution not to put yourself in a situation where that might happen to you. Now, of course, some people are unlucky. Uh, but other people might not have been careful as they could have been. Um, I can't speak for them, but I can speak for my team uh, and our operational disciplines that we applied. And I didn't want to see anyone that I worked with inside Syria, or Libya for that matter, come to harm. And I didn't want to see anyone humiliated by being paraded in front of someone else's unforgiving political camera for, uh, for the most base of reasons. So we plan our operations in a sense, um, I mean, don't be misled by the analogy, but we do it with military precision. Uh, these things are written down you and discussed at big meetings um, and also at very small meetings because one of the crucial things is of course to keep the information, the crucial information loop about movements um, and locations in a very, very small group indeed. Uh, but uh, the risks and where they come from and how to minimize them, because you can never rule out risk completely. Uh, and, uh, you know, the strategies, for example, when you go in somewhere, you need to have two exit strategies, not one. The trust you put in your Syrian colleagues and how much trust you feel you can put. All of these things are discussed, researched, explored. Uh, I wrote a manual for Al Jazeera on the safe operation of our teams in Syria uh, because I felt that after going in and out quite a few times in 2012 and, and leading the Al Jazeera push of journalists into Syria and being tasked with setting up the operational base for our movements in and out that I had to basically bring the corporate standards up to a certain level universally. So you, you don't have to throw your hands up in the air and say there's nothing I can do. There are things, there are things you can do, but you have to be very, very serious about it and very professional. Um, and that includes other disciplines too. You need medical training. Of course. Those sorts of things. It's so not yeah. only about reporting, yeah. but there are other fields as yeah. well. Okay, from this on, I remember this debate of employment of the freelancer and very untrained jobs yeah. in these zones. So in that way, I mean, you already answered. So this shouldn't be done somehow. Or well, oof, yo, yo, look, I was a freelancer once as well, you know. And yeah, that's the problem. Zone, yeah. That's the problem. You, uh, you know, young journalists need to have a chance to break into an industry. We don't all graduate from a course and end up with a job in a network TV channel. Most of us don't. Um, but many of us, as I always did have, aspire to end up working in difficult areas. And I, I never wanted to be a war correspondent per se because you don't want to spend your entire life working in conflict. Otherwise, you would never develop a balanced 
mm -hmm. uh, sense of your work as a journalist, your, your view of the world would be completely distorted mm -hmm. by what you saw around you routinely. So it, no, it wasn't about being a war correspondent, but challenging environments, yeah, I welcomed them. But you know, it's the, it's the how do you know unless you do mm -hmm. problem that anyone training journalists has. Uh, if, if, you, if you can't get the job with a big media organization, and most people can't, and if you, if you are one of thousands competing for a chance to work for the New York Times or Al Jazeera or you know, CNN, then how do you make yourself stand out above the crowd? Well, of course, anyone with any sense says, OK, well, what I do is I try and do something that no one else has done before. I show my courage. I show my resourcefulness. I show my mettle. And I'll, I'll do it by taking a risk. And, you know, you're in really, really dangerous ground here because, uh, I, I mean, I, I've been freelance for years. You know, don't, the Al Jazeera, um, last sort of five, six years of Al Jazeera has been a, uh, an island of stability and an otherwise very interesting um, freelance mix. Uh, and you, you really, really have to be careful because you are profoundly at risk as a freelancer. You often can't even afford the insurance to get you out of trouble if you're injured through no fault of your own. Uh, and if it is a kidnapping and you don't have kidnap insurance, then that burden falls to your poor family. So before you go off to be a hero, just think for a moment and consider what you might be inflicting on the people who love you, who will become captives of your own particular ambitions. But uh, young freelancers need to take risks. But, I, you know, we all need to have relationships with the young freelancers in the industry. Do I know young freelancers? Yes. Am I always, is my door always open to talk to them? Yes. If a freelancer had asked me last year if they should go anywhere near Syria, I would have said absolutely not. In fact, by the end of 2012, if a freelance journalist had asked me if they should go anywhere near the inside of Syria, I would have said absolutely not. They don't all take your advice. Yeah. Uh, but there are acceptable risks and unacceptable yeah, risks. Yeah, and Syria yeah. in 2012 crossed into the unacceptable by the end of that year. Uh, mainly with the arrival of foreign fighters, mm -hmm. because we all knew what that meant. Yeah. Syrian, Syrian fighters were on the whole really good people. Mm. Really changed. good people. From but it changed. changed From the end of 2012 yeah. it changed. And we could, we could smell it. It yeah. was... It was and obvious. Well, looking back to your experience again, because you worked in really print, radio, TV. Mm -hmm. Radio, yeah. Radio mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And different outlets, mm -hmm. BBC, News mm -hmm. TV, CNN, mm -hmm. Fox mm -hmm. News, mm -hmm. Al Jazeera. Mm -hmm. When you look back, which period or which times were the times that you enjoyed most? Oh, <sighs> that's so difficult. Uh, uh, each of the channels are so different. So different. Uh, and oddly enough, in the many ways that I feel I've been professionally blessed in my life, I think I've been with the people I needed to be with at the precise time that I needed to be with them. So if I explain it this way, I think New Zealand was a brilliant country to train as a journalist in because it's such a practical place with such a lack of hierarchy and such an emphasis and respect for craft skills. So if you're going to be a trainee, it's one of the best places to be a trainee at because people don't treat you with contempt. Uh, no one abuses your youth and inexperience. Mm. Everyone wants to help you grow. It's a very nurturing environment uh, and it leaves you hungry and fit for more. Um, the BBC was institutionally so moribund compared to the wonderful nimbleness of the other news organizations I've worked for. But by God, the resources yeah. that a uh, broadcaster has. And, and also, uh, you know, the, the wise old people that you can talk to there and the role models you have. Uh, and also the role models you can deconstruct. Sometimes your heroes of the BBC don't turn out to be quite that brilliant when you see them close up. And that's also useful when you're maturing as a journalist. You go, OK, I get how it works. You look good in this context, but actually you had a good producer. Or, you know, you, you're very good at commanding the public's attention, but in the newsroom, you're a nightmare. Mm. So, uh, you know, you, things are demystified. Yeah, yeah things are the, so you, you, you get a little bit more mature, you mm. grow up a bit. Uh, 
But um, Fox News was such a surprise to me because, of course, I had this liberal, elitist liberal uh, Guardian reader uh, dismay at the Fox News editorial agenda uh, as expressed out of its studio in New York. And yet my experience of Fox News as an operating news organization in the field was that it was beyond exemplary. And uh, it was so good in part because it had a minimal management structure. It trusted its people, its operational chiefs, its bureau chiefs on the ground. It picked good functioning people uh, at a, an implementation and, and command level. It uh, was a very, and these are the intangibles that you only learn by seeing. F Fox News had this amazing guy uh, called Frank whose job it was to set bureaus up around the world. But when I say set them up, I mean really establish them in ways that made you safer as a correspondent. So in Iraq, it wasn't simply that we rented an office from a decent Iraqi family and treated and maintained it well so that there would be no bitching about our irresponsibility as horrible foreigners colonizing Iraq. But our generator provided power to the entire Iraqi neighborhood and donations from our staff That's put smart. the local children through school. That's smart. And even he would go to the little old lady who kept chickens in two gardens along from where our bureau was, and he would buy her eggs every week and talk to her and take tea with her. This now, is exemplary, just like this, you said. I, I have never known yeah. any other news yeah, organization take, <laughs> and he did, you know, he production. wasn't grown by Fox. He came from another American network, but someone in Fox recognized that mm. he brought something uh, intangibly brilliant mm -hmm. to a news operation in a conflict zone and said, yup, we need him on our team, and they put him on the team. Um, I know, uh, you know, he's, he's one of the, the heroes of my professional career. I look back at what he did and I just mm. think, genius, genius. But the genius is also partly in spotting them and hiring them and yeah, making them yours. Uh, so, you know, this was good. But uh, I yearned for a multipolar broadcaster. You know, each of these organizations had their own worldview and their own political self-interests. And that's normal. Mm -hmm. BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation, they're not exactly going to be flying the flag yeah. for the French uh, yeah. worldview, are they? So, um, and, you know, I carry two passports, British born, New Zealand raised, uh, and my outlook really is more of a, a New Zealander than an, than an English person now, I would argue, in part because I, I know what post-colonialism feels like. Uh, and that New Zealand experience puts me in common with most of the rest yeah. of the world. But people who only know Britain don't it's really understand that. So, um, so uh, I yearned for an organization that wasn't constantly waving a flag. And when I joined Al Jazeera in 2009, uh, that was the, Al Jazeera English, that was the organization I felt I had found where a genuinely multinational newsroom staff all collaborated together to make sure that there was fairness in the broadcasting and no jingoism or, um, or, uh, or any of that nonsense. Uh, so that was a, a profound relief to me, actually, after years of thinking, mm. Yeah, mm. like the, yeah. Mm -hmm. so you know, uh, each of them, each, each of them the, uh, have had their major revelatory transformative effects on my professional life and I've been very lucky to work for them all. All right, the last question will be about Turkey. Turks will like mm. about all kind of, uh, hearing foreigners' opinions about that oh, country. I I don't, I don't, I think, because I want I'm, to hear more about um, Turkey as a news object and versus mm. Turkey as a place to live. Mm. So your experiences both working as a foreign correspondent in the country mm. and mm. living in this country. Mm. I mean, this will be the conclusion bit, but really, <laughs> this might go personal. How did you feel? How was your experience? How, how, how it has been? Because probably, or maybe you will be here longer. I don't think uh, I will never get Turkey out from under my skin now. It's, it's, it's here profoundly. Uh, you know, if, if I have a regret about Turkey at all, it's that I didn't live here enough because my roving correspondent role at Al Jazeera yeah, took me away from Turkey. In 2011, I lived in Libya and I was in Turkey for five weeks of the whole of 2011. Yeah. So people have said to me, oh, wow, you live in central Istanbul. It's such a cool city. Uh, you know, you must be out every night in my yeah, dreams. Yeah. Uh, I know it's happening. I can hear it happening. I can see the people having fun all over Istanbul every night, but I'm usually working late in the office. Turkey 
uh, you know, the simple answer to this and, and, and the genuine non-flattering answer to this is that I think, again, I have been very blessed because Turkey is utterly fascinating. Uh, and in ways that people who perhaps come from Europe don't understand. I think you have to come from Turkey from the other direction mm -hmm. to fully yeah. understand uh, the miracle that is modern Turkey because it took, for example, my colleagues in, uh, who were limited to British broadcasting a long, long time to understand that Turkey's role in the Middle East was utterly pivotal and that Turkey had in some strange way and in some extraordinarily accelerated trajectory suddenly pierced the heart of the Middle East question all over again and was playing an absolutely essential role. Um, quite a complex role and not as positive a role, I think, as Turkey hoped yeah. it would be. Um, but no harm in wanting. I mean, zero problems with your neighbours. I don't think a foreign policy, even if it didn't happen, um, has ever been so beautifully expressed. Even if there were problems in the realisation, I think the ambition was remarkable. Um, I wish other countries could adopt something as uh, humane, uh, as humanitarian, uh, as humanist as this. Uh, but Turkey, you know, it's not just geography, although, goodness me, what a great location. I used to say to people, Turkey is the new Lebanon. It, you know, Lebanon used to be the sexy place for foreign correspondents to be. Now, no question, it's Turkey. You've got your borders. You've got Syria and Iraq and Iran and Kurdistan. And, and then you've got R R Russia breathing down your neck. And Armenia, let's not forget Armenia, because yeah, Turkey never will. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got your, your two seas and you've got your human trafficking and, you know, your human trafficking corridor going through. So there's another river running through Turkey, apart from the Tigris Definitely. and the, the Euphrates. Mm -hmm. So Turkey is just as it always has been at the crossroads in history. And it's at the crossroads of history now again. Mm -hmm. And I have been here watching the alarm and delight and fascination of Turkish people as they felt the, the electricity of momentous events pass through them as well. And I've also been here to witness these extraordinarily uh, important uh, changes within Turkey, the Kurdish relationship, the um, Syrian relationship, the Kurdish uh, northern Iraqi relationship, uh, the, the European relationship shrivel, <laughs> you know, and to, who well, talks about yeah. Europe anymore? You know, so I've been here for this incredibly fertile period as a journalist, I, you know, the Mavi Marmara incident, uh, I was here for that. Um, uh, every week threw something huge at us. And, you know, what do journalists want more than anything? Not to be bored. Turkey has been, uh, what's the opposite of boring? Almost too interesting. You could die Time of being interesting. too <laughs> interested here yeah, in yeah. Turkey. It's been too fascinating. Thank goodness. It's been too Thanks fascinating. Thanks for being here as well, not only in Turkey, but also in our university. And we're always open, we have open doors for you whenever you want. Thanks, Anita.